Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, this afternoon, I am Sebastian Berka, the Associate Director at the Decision Center. And we're very happy to host the Bill Browder for conversation with Professor Luigi Zingales on uh, Kony capitalism in Russia. Thank you all for joining us for this whole event. Um, before we start, please know we are on the record and live streaming, so please silence your phones, but feel free to use social media. As usually, views expressed by our guests are their own, not those of the Stigler Center or the University of Chicago. As you may know, the Stigler Center promotes and diffuses research on regulatory capture and the various distortions that special interest groups impose on capitalism. We have many initiatives, including our podcast, Capitalism, which is the logo there, a co-hosted by Luigi and Kate Waldock, and our blog, ProMarket.org. So uh, please make sure to check them out. There is also one event that I would like to highlight in particular. On Tuesday, November 12th, at lunch, we will host Katarina Pistor from Columbia Law School on her new book, The Code of Capital. So please make sure to sign up on our website for that event, as it's almost sold out as well. Back to this afternoon, we look forward to an engaging conversation. But before we begin, please allow me to briefly introduce the speakers. Bill Browder is a Chicago alum and founder and CEO of Hermitage Capital Management. He also wrote the New York Times bestseller, Red Notice, which recounts his experience in Russia. Mr. Browder was the largest foreign investor in Russia until 2005, when he was denied entry into the country and declared a national security threat because of his battle against corporate corruption. Russian authorities raided his offices and seized 230 million in company taxes. Mr. Browder's lawyer, Sergei Manitsky, was arrested, tortured, and killed in custody for attempting to investigate the crime. Since then, Mr. Browder has fought for justice for, justice for Mr. Magnitsky, heading a global campaign to impose visa bans and asset freezes on human rights abusers, particularly those who played a role in Magnitsky's false arrest, torture, and death. His efforts uh, led to Congress adopt, adopting the Magnitsky Act in 2012, among others. And tonight, the university will celebrate Mr. Browder with an award for achievements that have brought distinction to themselves, credit to the university, and real benefit to their communities. Uh, congratulations, well deserved. And our moderator today is Professor Luigi Zingales. He is the Robert C. McCormack Professor of Finance and the Charles Harper Faculty Fellow at Wood and the Faculty Director of the Stigler Center. His research and interest span from corporate governance to financial development and from political economy to the economic effects of culture, among others. And he has also written several books and appears frequently in the media. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming our speakers today. Thank you. Uh, you have to realize that uh, not only Biela came as a student to the University of Chicago, but he grew up in Hyde Park. And basically, once you survive Hyde Park in the of Chicago, Putin is nothing for you. <laughs> so that's, that's, a, that's a good thing. But uh, uh, he's such a, a great uh, entertainer himself that I think I should let him speak for a little while, and then I will ask a question, and then I will open for questions, because I think this message is very powerful, and I don't want to sort of uh, destroy the power of this message. Is working? Yeah, it is working. Oh, trouble with the stack there. So yeah, I, I started out um, all the way from the nursery school at the University of Chicago, and uh, and um, and I went all the way through the University of Chicago. And in fact, I lived here. Um, before before this business school was here, um, the dormitories were here. <laughs> um, and the, the, there was a dormitory called Woodward Court. I don't know if it's been relocated since I was here, but uh, it was on this exact site um, that we're sitting in today. Um, anyways, I'm, I'm really pleased to, it's a homecoming for me to come home to the University of Chicago. I'm glad, to, glad to be here. Um, on May 29, 2018, I was traveling from London to Madrid. I was invited to Madrid by the chief anti-corruption prosecutor of Spain to provide him with um, evidence in a criminal case that he had opened in which he had found money from the Magnitsky case, my lawyer who was murdered, was murdered in Russia, coming to Spain 
um, which would be used to buy luxury real estate in Spain. And so he made a formal request for me to come in and give evidence. I get on the plane, I arrive on the 29th of May, I check into my hotel, um, I use my American Express card and they give me a nice upgrade in the hotel that I'm staying in. Um, and my meeting is scheduled as an early morning meeting on the next morning. And an early morning meeting in Spain is 11 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> so I um, roll out of my hotel room at 9.30, I open the door, and um, standing right outside the door about to knock is the uh, manager of the hotel, the guy who gave me the nice upgrade. And behind him are two Spanish police officers. And, um, and the hotel manager asks me, tells me that these people are here because they need to see my identification. I hand them my passport. They compare my passport to a piece of paper that they're holding. And then they say, uh, Mr. Browder, you're under arrest. And I said, what for? And they said, Interpol, Russia. And at this point, the hotel manager panics He's not panicked about me being arrested. He's worried about his, his upgraded hotel room being um, occupied with all of my belongings for, for some indefinite period of time. <laughs> <laughs> so he starts negotiating with them to see whether I can get my stuff out of the room. <laughs> and he succeeds, and so I'm able to go into the room. And, um, and in several rooms, this is sweet. And I was able to get out of the eye line and so they can't see me. Um, and I, I'm, a, I'm a big Twitter user, so I took out my phone and I immediately tweeted, urgent being arrested in Madrid, Spain right now on the Russian Interpol war. Not sure where they're taking me. I then pack my bags really quickly. We go down to the lobby, I pay my bill. Um, uh, they throw me into the back of the police car. And this is a serious police car. They can't roll down the windows, they can't open the doors. There's plexiglass between um, the prisoner and the policeman. And we're, they put on the lights and sirens and we're off to the police station. And um, I wasn't sure whether anyone had, had actually um, believed my tweet because my account could have been hacked. Um, uh, I could have been joking. It, it sounded pretty dramatic what was happening. And I, went, and I was pretty, it was pretty important to me that people knew I was being arrested. And strangely, these um, Spanish police officers, they hadn't handcuffed me and they hadn't patted me down and they hadn't taken my phones away. And so I, I took out my phone um, and brought it up just a little bit above the um, sort of the place with the back of the seats. And I took a picture of the back of their heads and all the uh, sort of radio paraphernalia on the dashboard, so it's obvious that I was in the police car. I took a picture and I tweeted out another tweet saying, in the back of the car on the, on the way to the police station. Um, now at this point, anyone who was doubting that I was being arrested didn't doubt it anymore. And all of a sudden, my phone, my phone started lighting up with news alerts from Bloomberg and the Financial Times and Wall Street Journal. Bill Brown was being arrested in Madrid on Russian warrant. And all of a sudden, my phone started lighting up. And I, and it was on silent, but it started lighting up with, with calls from jur journalists all over the world. And I wasn't going to take their calls, but all of a sudden, after like the fifth call comes in, I see that it's um, uh, my... Um, uh, lawyer, my Spanish lawyer, Carlos, called. And he is someone I definitely needed to talk to to be arrested. <laughs> <laughs> and so I kind of leaned down in the seat hoping that these guys weren't going to notice and say, Carlos, I'm being arrested. And, and, um, and at this point, they, they, uh, they, uh, they saw that I was talking on the phone. They squeezed the car over the side of the road. They jumped out and grabbed me. They uh, pretty violently. Um, uh, they said, you're not supposed to be talking on the phone. You're not supposed to have your phones. They took my phones away and um, shoved me back in the car off to the police station. So we, uh, we arrived at the police station, and this is just a normal uh, police station in central Madrid. And it's not every day that they get an international fugitive, and so <laughs> there was like, really a, a lot of excitement in the police station. And so they put me in the holding cell, and, and uh, like everyone like, from the whole police station sort of popped their head in to kind of get a look at this, uh, this dangerous fugitive that they just arrested. <laughs> and um, I was sitting there for about an hour, and, and um, kind of, you know, as time went on, I started to get more and more worried about how I, was, how I was going to extract myself from the situation. And um, about an hour into it, the, um, the mood of the whole police station, you could feel it deflating. It was uh, visceral. And I didn't know what, what was happening. But then about 10 minutes after that, the uh, chief of police comes in, along with the, um, the, the main translator. And he says, I've just been off the phone with Interpol. Um, they've informed me that um, 
uh, your arrest warrant is invalid, you're free to go. So when I say that, I'm really happy to be here. <laughs> So how did I get myself into this mess? Um, and I'll just take you through the story in like five or ten minutes, and then we can talk about um, what are the, all the things that all, all the obvious questions that come from the story. But but I was um, at one time um, uh, the largest foreign investor in Russia. When I after I um, finished the University of Chicago, I should step back. My grandfather was the leader of the Communist Party of America. My rebellion. <coughs> was to become a capitalist. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and um, after I finished the University of Chicago, I, I worked at Bain for two years, and then I went to Stanford Business School. And I finished business school in 1989, which is the year the Berlin Wall came down. And I thought the perfect um, sort, of, sort of historical symmetry in my family is that my grandfather was the biggest communist in America, and the Berlin Wall has come down. I'm going to try to be the biggest capitalist in Russia. <laughs> and that's what I set out to do. I ended up at Solomon Brothers at the beginning of the Russian privatization program. And my first assignment was to advise a fishing fleet located in Romance on their privatization. And I go up to Romance, and um, the head of the fishing fleet takes me to see one of the ships, and, and this enormous vessel, 400 feet long. And I ask him, how much does one of these things cost? And he said, $20 million new. How many do you have in your fleet? 100. About 20 million times 100. To $2 billion of ships. What's the average age of your fleet? Seven years. So I figured that's about half depreciated a billion dollars of ships. And I had been hired to um, advise the management on whether to exercise the, the legitimate right under the privatization program of Russia uh, to buy 51%. And I said, at what price uh, is only 51%? And they said, two and a half million dollars. <laughs> So a billion dollars of the ships, and you could buy 51% for $2.5 million. You didn't need a Chicago booth MBA. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's what inspired me to become an investor in Russia. I didn't want to be advising on this stuff. I wanted to invest in this stuff. And, and I eventually um, left Solomon Brothers. I set up a fund called Hermitage Fund. I moved to Moscow. I was one of the very first Westerners to set up in Moscow. I started my investment fund with $25 million of capital from a man named Edmund Safra. And eventually, through a, steep, a series of, of um, ups and downs, I eventually became the largest foreign investor in Russia with $4.5 billion in assets and management. And the trouble with um, my investment fund was that um, I owned shares of Russian companies, but I didn't have a share, I didn't have any economic share in the Russian companies. And the reason I didn't have an economic share of these companies was because the oligarchs um, were stealing the money. And there was no rule of law in the country. And, and so even though Russian stocks were incredibly undervalued, um, they could be incredibly more valuable if I could somehow find a way to get them to stop stealing the money. And so I decided to become a shareholder activist in Russia. And it's a lot different being a shareholder activist in Russia than it is being a shareholder activist in America, the types of things I was fighting against were massive stealing, like tens, twenty billion dollars, thirty billion dollars of stealing from some of these companies. And the way that I started to fight against it was to research um, how they did the stealing, and then to share my research um, with the international media. And um, for a brief period of time, my um, uh, naming and shaming campaigns worked. And the reason that they worked was because I started them at a time when Vladimir Putin had just come into power. And I've never spoken to Vladimir Putin then, and I still haven't spoken to him now. I've never met him. Um, but we had this alignment of interest when he first came to power, because the oligarchs who were stealing money from me were stealing power from him. And, um, and he wanted to take the power back from the oligarchs. And so every time I would publicize one of these scandals involving these big Russian companies I was invested in, Vladimir Putin um, would step in to the um, conflict and use all the power that he had, and some of it was limited, but he grew and grew, grew um, uh, come down hard on the oligarchs. And so we exposed um, a, a massive um, asset stripping scheme at Gazprom. They ended up firing the uh, 
Gazprom's largest oil and gas company in the world, and it's the biggest company in Russia. He ended up firing the CEO of Gazprom. Um, there was a massive um, proposed asset stripping scheme at the electricity company, and we got the government to vote their shares to change the charter of the company to cancel it. They, took, they um, did a, um, a dilution of shares of the National Savings Bank, Spare Bank, at a 70, I think it's a 75 percent discount to the market value to a close group of investors, and we weren't able to stop it, but we got them to change the law to say that all future share issues have to be rights issues. And so we did a lot of stuff, and every time we would come up with a scandal, Putin would do something to, to change the situation. And so for a while, I was actually a supporter of Putin, and I thought that he was cleaning up Russia. But it turned out that his um, activities were not um, for the good of Russia. Um, they were to um, go after his enemies. And he decided to go for broke um, at the end of 2003 in order to win his war with the oligarchs. And he arrested the rich, richest oligarch in Russia, a man named Mikhail Vortikovsky, who was the owner of an oil company called Yukos. He arrested him off of his private jet in Siberia. He um, brought him back to Moscow, and he put him on trial for tax evasion. And in Russia, when you're on trial in a criminal case, um, there's a 99.7% conviction rate. And so there's not really any presumption of innocence. And because there's no presumption of innocence, when you go on trial, you sit in a cage, because that's where you're going to be out after the trial is over. And so they put Hortikovsky in the cage, and they allowed the television cameras to come into the courtroom and film uh, the richest man in Russia sitting in a cage. Now imagine you're the 17th richest man in Russia. You're on your yacht. You're parked off the Hotel du Cap in Antibes, France. Uh, you finished up with your mistress in the bedroom. You um, wander out to the living room. You flick on CNN. And there before you is a guy far richer, far better, far more powerful than you sitting in a cage. What's your natural reaction? <laughs> you don't want to sit in that cage yourself. And so one by one by one, the oligarchs went to Putin after Hortikovsky was sentenced to 10 years in jail and said, Vladimir, what do we have to do to make sure we don't sit in a cage? And he said, real simple, 50%. Not 50% for the Russian government or 50% for the presidential administration of Russia, 50% for Vladimir Putin. And at that moment in time, this was June of 2004, Vladimir Putin became the richest man in the world. Um, and he became partners in the oligarchs and all of their activities. And I carried on doing my naming and shaming campaigns, uh, but I was no longer naming and shaming Putin's enemies, I was naming and shaming Putin's personal financial interests. And, um, it took them about a year to figure out what to do with me. And in November of 2005, as I was flying back to Russia, I was stopped at the border. I was arrested. I was detained for 15 hours. And then I was deported and declared a threat to national security. Um, now, when, when the Russians turn on you, they don't tend to do so mildly. They tend to do so with extreme prejudice. And uh, being deported, well, it was terrible if you're running a Russian-focused fund and not allowed to come to the country. But they could do a lot worse. And the two places they could do a lot worse was they could arrest my people or they could seize my assets. And so I organized an emergency evacuation of my team and their dependents. And we quickly and quietly sold every last share that we held in Russia. And we got everything out. And we actually got everything out like 10% below the, um, the historical top of the Russian stock market. <laughs> has never been so high. <laughs> and so it's better lucky than smart, but, but um, everyone got out with, like having made a lot of money. And so my clients all were very happy with me because we made a lot of money. I dodged a big bullet. Um, and I said, I'm going to go set up an investment fund to invest in other bad countries. Um, <laughs> and a lot of them came along and invested with me. And so we started a new fund. I tried to put Russia behind me. Um, and I thought I was done with Russia. But 18 months after I was expelled, um, and the only thing I kept in Russia was, was that I kept, that I had a prepaid lease on my office and I had a secretary there. And I kept, them, I kept her there. And I get a call from the secretary. Um, I'm at a board meeting in Paris. And she's frantic you know, what's going on. And she said, there's 25 police officers reading my office, or reading our office right now. What should I do? And I said, I'm not sure. Let me call up my lawyer. And so I call up an American lawyer in Moscow who worked for me on all of our stuff. 
And he sounded a little distracted. And, and I said, Jamie, there's 25 police officers raiding my office. What should I do? And he said, I, I, don't, I don't know. There's 25 police officers raiding my office right now looking for your documents. Let me get back to you. In total, there were 50 police officers looking for the stamps, and seals, and certificates for our investment holding companies in Russia, which were empty at this point because we had sold everything. But they didn't seem to know that. They found all those documents at the law firm. They seized them. And the next thing we know, we no longer own our investment holding companies. There are these empty investment holding companies have been fraudulently re-registered out of our name into the name of a man who, had been, uh, who was a convicted killer, um, who had been let out of jail early by the police, put his name on these documents. He became the new owner of our companies. They were empty, so it wasn't like I had any economic risk here, but I was terrified that if the police were working with murderers to, to steal our companies, what else were they going to do? And so I went out and I hired the smartest lawyer I knew in Russia, a young man named Sergei Magnitsky, to investigate. And Sergei uh, investigated, and he said that the, he came back and said there's two parts of the scam. One was they wanted to steal your assets, but you got your assets out before they could get to them. The second part of the scam was, um, which they did succeed in, was that when you were selling all of your securities in the previous year, and, uh, we, we, had, we had sold everything, and we paid a, uh, we had a billion dollar profit, and we paid $230 million of capital gains tax to the Russian government. And so what Sergei had figured out was that these um, crooks took our stolen companies back to the tax authorities, and they said there was a mistake made in the previous year's tax filing. These companies didn't earn a billion dollars, they earned zero. They came up with some complicated way to uh, express that. Therefore, the $230 million of taxes that was paid last year was paid in error. And so they applied for a $230 million tax refund on the 23rd of December of 2007, two days before Christmas. And it was approved and paid out the next day. No questions asked. Now, we were convinced that Putin was some type of nationalist, and this couldn't. How could he allow the theft of nearly a quarter of a billion dollars. This was my money that was being stolen. This was the Russian government's money being stolen. And we figured if we just brought it to the highest level of the Russian uh, law enforcement, that the good guys would get the bad guys. And so we, we filed a, a criminal complaint with every different law enforcement agency in Russia. I publicized it through the radio and, and newspapers in Russia and, and internationally. And Sergei went to the Russian State Investigative Committee, which is their version of the FBI, and gave a sworn uh, written statement against the uh, police officers involved. And we sat back and waited for the good guys to get the bad guys. Well, it turns out that in Putin's regime, there are no good guys. And instead of going after the people who stole the money, on November 24th, the officers that Sergei testified against came to his home at 8 in the morning, arrested him, put him in pretrial detention, where he was then tortured to get him to withdraw his testimony. Uh, they put him in cells with uh, 14 inmates and eight beds and left the lights on 24 hours a day to impose sleep deprivation. Uh, they put him in cells with no heat, no window panes in December in Moscow, so they really froze to death. They put him in cells with no uh, toilet, just a hole in the floor where the sewage would bubble up. And the purpose of all this was to get him to withdraw his testimony against the uh, police officers. And they wanted to get him to sign a false confession to say that he stole the $230 million. And he did so on my instruction. And Sergei was a man of such an incredible integrity um, that for him the idea of perjuring himself and bearing false witness was worse than what they were doing to him. He refused. Um, and, um, and the pressure just got worse and worse and worse. After about six months of this, his, his health started to deteriorate. He, um, he ended up getting terrible pains in his stomach. Uh, he lost 40 pounds. He was diagnosed as having pancreatitis and gallstones and needing an operation which was scheduled for the 1st of August, 2009. A week before the operation, they came to him again, again asked him to find him to sign a false confession. Again, he refused. And um, they then abruptly moved him to a prison, a maximum security prison called Butyrka, which is considered to be one of the most hell hole prisons in Russia. And most significantly for Sergei, there was no medical facilities there. And at Butyrka, his health completely broke down. He went into a terrible downward spiral they refused him all medical attention. He and his lawyers wrote 20 different desperate requests for medical attention. 
every one of the requests was either ignored or denied in writing. And on the night of November 16th, 2009, uh, Sergei Magnitsky went into critical condition. On that night, the authorities of Bukirka didn't want to have responsibility. So they put him in an ambulance, sent him to a different prison across town that had a medical wing. When he arrived at the different prison, instead of putting him in the emergency room, they put him in an isolation cell, they chained him to a bed, and eight riot guards with rubber batons beat him until he died. He was 37 years old. He left a wife and two children. I got the news um, the morning of the 17th of November, and it was the most horrifying, traumatic, life-changing news I could have ever gotten. Sergei Magnitsky uh, was killed because he was my lawyer. If he hadn't been my lawyer, he'd still be alive today. And so I made a vow to his memory, to his family, to myself, that I was going to put aside all of my other activities, all of my business, and I was going to devote all of my time, all of my resources, and all of my energies to going after the people who murdered him and make sure that they face justice. And for 10 years, that's what I've been doing. And I tried initially to get justice in Russia, but the Russian authorities uh, completely refused. They circled the wagons. Uh, they exonerated everybody who got any role in his death or torture. Um, they even promoted some of the people who were most complicit. And so I said to myself, we can't get justice inside Russia, we may get justice outside of Russia. And um, I came up with an idea, which is that the people who killed him, killed him for the $230 million. And those people don't, kill that, don't, don't keep that money in Russia, because as easy as they stole it, they can be stolen from them. They keep that money in the West. They, um, they buy villas in the south of France, and townhouses in Belgravia and London. They send their kids to boarding school in Switzerland, and their girlfriends on shopping trips to Milan. And I came up with this idea, which was to ban their visas and freeze their assets. And I took this idea to Washington. And I met with a Democratic senator from Maryland named Benjamin Card, Republican senator from Arizona, John McCain. And I told him the story that I shared with you. And I said, can we ban the visas and freeze the assets of these people? And they said, yes. And that became known as the Magnitsky Act. The Magnitsky Act um, uh, uh, started out as just an act for Sergei Magnitsky. Um, but as soon as they publicized what they were doing, their phones lit up as other victims started coming forward. They said, you've hit the Achilles heel of the Putin regime. This is what these people care about. They care about their money. Can you sanction the people who killed my brother, my father, my aunt, my sister? And after about a dozen of these calls, these, these um, senators realized there was something much bigger than just one case. And they added 65 words to the law to include all gross human rights and features. This is one of the few things um, that people could agree on in Washington, that Russian torturers and killers couldn't come to America. And when it went for a vote, it passed the Senate 92 to 4. It passed the House of Representatives with 89%. And it became a federal law on December 14, 2012. Vladimir Putin went out of his mind. <clears throat> he banned the adoption of Russian orphans by American families in retaliation. He made it his single largest foreign policy priority to repeal the Magnitsky Act. He sent an emissary to Trump Tower on June 9th, 2016, to meet before, after Donald Trump was, was nominated, before he was elected, uh, to meet with Donald Trump Jr., Jared Kushner, and Paul Manafort. This woman, a female lawyer named Natalia Veselinskaya, uh, uh, had one request to repeal the Magnitsky Act. There's been a lot of things the Russians have done to try to repeal the Magnitsky Act. None of them have worked. And I'm proud to say that not only has it not been repealed, but it's been expanded. Um, uh, these senators realized that, that why should Russian bad guys, um, or why should Chinese bad guys, Venezuelan bad guys, or, or Angolan bad guys get a better deal than the Russian bad guys? And they, they, they uh, put together the Global Magnitsky Act, which passed in December of 2016. Um, on that same day, the Estonian government unanimously passed, the parliament unanimously passed the Estonian Magnitsky Act. Um, in October of the next year, the Canadian Parliament unanimously passed the Canadian Magnitsky Act. And then the Lithuanian Parliament passed the Lithuanian Magnitsky Act. And then the Latvian Parliament passed the Latvian Magnitsky Act. After the Skripal poisoning in Britain, the British Parliament passed the British Magnitsky Act. And we're now working on an EU Magnitsky Act, which will be the, the real clincher if we get it. Um, 
this um, story of what happened to Sergei Magnitsky is a burden that I'm going to have to live with for a long time. But I have been able to give him a, um, a legacy, and the legacy is the Magnitsky Act. And the Magnitsky Act is very, very powerful because for every person it sanctions, there's a thousand more that are afraid of being sanctioned. And being put on the Magnitsky list means that you're effectively a non-citizen in the world of finance <coughs> afterwards. If you're on the sanctions list, every bank will close their account no matter where it is in the world. And it's, it's truly gratifying to watch bad guys squirming as they get stuck on the Magnitsky list. And it's always and it's, and it's gratifying to see the fear that is created among bad guys elsewhere. And there's a lot of bad guys um, who are just very practical people who, who say to themselves, you know, I'm not sure if the dictator of my country is going to be in power in five years' time. Do I want to have a lifetime of, of trouble um, for taking their orders? And some people won't be doing the torture and killing that they might have otherwise done. And for that, um, Sergei Magnitsky's death hasn't been a meaningless death, and hopefully his death will have saved lives. That's my story. Well, wow, that's a quite a, an impressive story. But uh, what I want to stress is, uh, in general, when people think about somebody fighting this corruption and justice, they, they think about uh, a leftist uh, hippie with a devil. And here is that uh, you are a prototypical capitalist <laughs> fighting the, the good battle for a cleaner capitalist system. And uh, you do it following uh, the rules, following democracy, and you are incredibly effective. It's just the Magnitsky Act is a very powerful instrument that uh, not only now is uh, impacting Russia, but as you said, impacts all the, the other countries. So um, what is your secret for being so effective? Well, I, I think part, part of the reason that this was so effective was that the story was so horrific. I mean, Sergei Magnitsky's story was a story of good versus evil, black versus white. He was a guy trying to do the right thing trying to fight corruption in his own country. And instead of being rewarded for doing that, he's savagely tortured in the most vicious way and killed. And anyone who hears that story and looks at the facts behind the story are so, so appalled by that. You, you can't hear that story and not want to do something about it. And so it wasn't like I was I had hired some fancy lobbyists to go into Washington to like lobby for, you know, tobacco you know, tobacco companies or something like that. And this was you know, th this was good versus evil, and, 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 and in fact, they're all relieved that the, these senators and congressmen were relieved to have me come there to like talk about the, these guys become politicians to do this type of work. It, 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 it always goes in the wrong direction, but th they're, to actually do something good is, is, is something that, that these people want to do. And have somebody come in, I mean, it, it, you know, to, to, I'm not the victim, but I'm, but I'm a representative of the victim, and, and to have, and, and have a, have a businessman, have a hedge fund manager who's given up his life as a hedge fund manager to go get justice. That's a pretty powerful, that's a pretty powerful thing. Um, that says a lot. And, and, and there wasn't a person I met, well, actually, there may be one or two, but, but you know, there's four people who voted against him in the Senate. But, uh, <laughs> you have to move for that. <laughs> I found one of them, and it was really horrifying. But, um, but, <laughs> but, 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 um, uh, you know, it's, it's you know the power of the story and, and the, the purity of the story and the fact that I was ready to make big sacrifices and to take huge personal risk to do this was an extremely powerful message for these people and and, and they, they uh, and it appealed to them and it appeals to everybody who hears the story. But the people I'm always up against and this is this is what's interesting. So I go to any lawmaker. So if I go to a lawmaker, a member of Congress, they're not going to lose votes by banning Russian tortures and murders coming into America. <laughs> But every, but every country, the people who were against me, were the State Department or foreign ministries of the country. The State Department was absolutely against me. Why was the State Department against me? Because it complicates their relationship with Russia. And the foreign office in, in Britain was against me, and the foreign ministry in Canada was against me. <clears throat> and it was always a question of getting parliamentary pressure to overcome institutional bureaucratic government pressure. And, and it wasn't easy. So in, in the United States, it was the only place where, where the parliament, Congress, is a co-equal branch of government. Um, in, in, in Canada, the leading party in parliament forms the government. And so it's, you can't make the, you can't um, 
force the government to do something if the leading party in parliament doesn't do that. Um, and, 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 the, and the government is always, is always advised by, by um, their foreign office not to do it. And so that was always what I had to overcome. And it was always some circumstance that allowed me to overcome it. Like in Britain, after the scriptball poisoning. In Canada, the, all, all the, um, uh, the, the intense um, debate about, around um, uh, the, the Russians going to Trump Tower to try to repeal the Magnitsky Act, they, they, they thought, OK, maybe, this, maybe there's something here. Um, and, and so I, I wouldn't say if there was a function of me being, I mean, if, I was, if, I, if, if, if you gave me the portfolio of the lobby for vaporless tobacco, I don't think I'd be very successful. Um, but, but I had a good cause, and I, was caught, and I did it well because it was, it was something I believed in. Yeah, but there are a lot of good causes. Not all of them get uh, the success rate that, that you had. And, and many of uh, our students want to know what they can do. And it's just, uh, one of the power of your story is you sacrifice a very successful career as a hedge fund manager in order to fight this battle, uh, and had enormous success in, in uh, pushing the agenda. But uh, um, one of the things that you said that I think is, is very important, and we don't uh, internalize enough, is these people get credibility by being in the West, by sending their kids to sort of a, a private uh, boarding school in Switzerland, uh, and uh, by belonging to the world of art, by going to the fancy places, and all sorts of stuff. And so in a sense, by accepting them, by being part of them, by not uh, isolating them, we are helping them. So, what can we do? Can what each one of us can do to uh, minimize the power of this oligarchs, the power of Putin? Well, and we're we're right in the middle of it right now. It's not just the oligarchs; it's like China right now. So, so I mean, look at this whole NBA thing. So, you know, the um, you had uh, you had one um, uh, uh, captain, uh, captain or manager of one team saying something, a manager, yeah. saying something bad about uh, China. And then China says, we don't want to, um, the NBA is banned. And then everyone, and then all sorts of idiots from the NBA are saying, oh, no, we didn't mean it. No. Uh, um, you know, money is only so valuable. I mean, you know, we, have, we can't like, give up our, our principles for money. And, and same thing is true with Saudi Arabia. They, 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 the Saudis attract Jamal Khashoggi to the, in, to the embassy, to the consulate in, in Istanbul. Um, and then they, they uh, chop him into little pieces and, and take him out. Um, and and, and then Saudi Arabia has this uh, uh, Davos in the desert, and, and all the big financial institutions are showing up there desperate for Saudi money. Who does not take that money? I mean, money, you know, it, it, I, I, you know we're all, this is a business school. I, I was a businessman. I understand that you, know, you try to maximize profits, but it's okay not to like, you don't have to like, Maximize to the nth degree. There's, there's plenty of, you know, there's, you know, most people didn't take Pablo Escobar's money. Why is it okay to take Putin's money? And and I could, I, I could argue that that and I and I think that um, you know everybody was going to be in different situations in their lives, but um, most people are not sensitized to that at all. I mean, I know all these people in Silicon Valley that are happy to take Saudi money, um, and and like, they don't have, and, and and they were happy to take Russian money, and 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 you don't have to. There's so many other sources of money. It's not like the only places that have money. And so I think that, that um, uh, everyone is going to be faced with it. And, and, and you, know, you don't have to go out and become a human rights activist to like, do good in the world, but you can just like, you know, be conscious and, 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 and um, you know, have, have, have a moral compass about this stuff. And, and everyone of you will be faced with these choices at some point about whether to do business with bad guys because it's profitable. And you don't have to. And, and you can be successful and not do that. Um, and and um, and there's a lot of the, and there's a lot of bad people in business that are just like I mean I, I was a hedge fund manager in the world of hedge fund managers I mean they're the most amoral um, people and and, um, and it's hard for me to be around some of the people I used to be sort of my compatriots because they're so amoral about the whole thing and and they, and they even take pride in their amorality because that makes them better hedge fund managers to be totally dispassionate about you know, these types of things but it's just. You know, it's it's it, it's a sick it's a sick a sickness that doesn't need to you don't need to have that you don't have you don't have to be some bleeding heart to to, to not want to do business with people who, who chop up journalists and eat the little pieces it's okay not to. 
But where do you draw the line? Because I think that uh, clearly chopping out the journalists is no good. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but there is a lot of a continuum. Where do you draw the line? Um, I draw the line with doing business with companies from rule of law countries um, that don't have horrible human rights records. So, I mean, I, I, there's a lot of, I mean, uh, this is probably a, a, a longer discussion than we have in our hour, but, you know, I wouldn't do business with Azerbaijan or Kazakhstan or Russia or Saudi Arabia. Um, and, um, and with China, China is a different story. China, there's just so much business going on, but, um, uh, you know, China says, if you do this, we're not going to do business with you. You know, I mean, um, unless it's the only, it's your only source of revenue. Um, uh, I mean, this whole NBA thing really, really left a bad feeling in my stomach. I think it left a, lot, a bad feeling in a lot of people's stomachs. I think a lot of people felt really bad about that. And, 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 it, and it lowers, it, it makes you feel worse about, um, uh, about the world to think that, that that's how the world works. You know, we, we are so blessed to live in democracies where you can think what you want to think and do what you want to do. And to reinforce that because um, of some bad guys. Can be, it, it, we can turn it the other way around. Um, uh, we don't have to buy their stuff if they're going to be like that. Now, what is the next step to the Magnitsky Act in the sense that uh, you're trying to pass in the EU, etc.? But I think that uh, what is the next uh, step in the direction of uh, fighting against the bad guys, as you call them? Well, the other thing which is really important, which is something we've been doing since Magnitsky was killed, is we said, who got the $230 million he was killed over? And I, I employed a team of people for 10 years to find the money. We found the money. It went everywhere. And, and when we find where it goes, we then take the evidence that we have, and we, we file criminal complaints with the law enforcement agencies of the country where we find it. And sometimes they open a criminal case, sometimes they freeze the money, sometimes they don't. It's interesting to see where they do and where they don't. And so we found the money in Switzerland, they opened a criminal case. We found the money in France, and they froze about 20 million bucks. We found the money in France, they opened a criminal case, they froze 8 million dollars. We found the money in the Netherlands, they opened a criminal case, they froze 3 million euros. We found the money in the UK, most of all, they didn't even open a criminal case. Um, and so it's... And, and so, Why? Um, <laughs> well, it's interesting. So, so, so they... they um, uh, uh, I got a letter back from the National Crime Agency, and, they, and it said, uh, we don't think a domestic investigation into money laundering is the, is the uh, best way forward. So, which means that not doing the investigation is the best way forward. <laughs> and, and, and it was interesting, because the guy who wrote the letter, um, he eventually left the National Crime Agency, and he called me up uh, about a year later, and he said, I, I, I can, we, can we meet? And I said, yes. And so we ended up um, organizing a lunch near my office in London. And he sat down and he said, I really want to apologize to you because um, I was in charge of the uh, international money laundering investigation team at the National Crime Agency and since left. Um, but I, 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 I wanted to open an investigation and I advised, the, um, uh, I advised my bosses that we were going to open an investigation. There was enough evidence to open an investigation. And they told me I'm under no uncertain terms not to open an investigation. And he said the foreign office liaison, the foreign office of the State Department was the person who gave that instruction. So somebody thought it was going to upset Russia to, to run a criminal investigation. So, did. so in, in the United Kingdom, the government can stop the prosecutor from going ahead in the investigation? Well, in theory, they can't. But in, in practice, they did. That's one discriminable rule of law. Is that well, it's, it's very interesting. So then I went to the parliament and I said, I told the story. I told, told the story of the parliament. And everyone in the parliament's upset, banging the table, we need to open a criminal prison. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, and of course, the parliament can't make the, make the law enforcement do an investigation, but the parliament can make the uh, home office, the um, like attorney general, whatever. To, uh, and so they're banging on the table and they ask the home office, the home, home secretary. Um, uh, uh, it starts uh, banging on the table. We need to open a criminal investigation, but he, the Home Secretary, can't tell the um, the, uh, the, 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 head, the chief of police of the National Crime Agency. And so it works one way, but it doesn't seem to work the other way. So, um, uh, so anyway, so, so what needs to be done? Um, it's very interesting. So, so the, the, the transparency is like the the, is the the cure all of all these situations. And um, there's this example. So in, in London. There's this road called the A40 where you take from central London and it goes towards the airport. And it used to be when you ride on the A40, you could go really fast until you hit a speed camera and you slow down. Um, and they figured out that instead of doing it that way, they, they now have a speed camera at the beginning of the road 
and a speed camera at the end of the road, and they calculate your average speed over the road and take a picture of every license plate. And if you go over the average speed, then they send you a ticket. And guess what? Everybody's going exactly 40 miles an hour on that road because you can't get away with it. And so the, the, the corollary in, in, in money laundering is if, if, if um, it, it's, it's, it's quite, technology can easily solve this problem if there's, if there's clear transparency and, and availability of information. So, that every, so all you do, I mean, it's like, it's like insider trading. Now, now computers pick it up. You know, you know, it doesn't like, if, if they did the same thing with international money laundering, there would be no more international money laundering. And the Russians would be out of luck because their entire system is based on criminal proceeds. Um, but until there's that, that situation, it's easy to sort of skirt the rules. And that's the reason why I expect you to say that the next step of the Magnitsky Act is to uh, force uh, um, transparency of ultimate ownership around the world. I saw that uh, even the Cayman Island now are going slowly in that direction. And by the way, Delaware is behind in that direction. Yeah, the America's worse. Yeah. I mean, so transparency is a key. And, 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 and it's going in that direction. But it's not, not just beneficial ownership, but all, all these financial flows have to be on a database that can be searchable by law enforcement in an easy and, and transparent way. And the technology is absolutely there to do it. It's just purely every country has its own sovereign domestic law enforcement. And, and, and it takes 10 years, literally 10 years, to investigate a case because every country has to do mutual legal assistance requests with other countries. They don't respond to each other. It's, and it's, like, it's, it's literally like 18th century. Um, uh, and it's really easy to get away with these crimes. And, and finally, this is true even within the European Union that they claim that they are. The European Union, every single country is like you know the you know the French are like really upset with the Cypriots, and they have to like they have, you know and the you know and the Dutch are upset with the Latvians, and it's all it's a, you know it's it's, it's primitive. Um, and but so, do you think that uh, there would be some uh, significant progress in this direction? Yeah, for, for sure, for sure. It seems I, I think there's another ten years for the money launderers before this, the whole thing it becomes impossible to do. It just won't be possible in 10 years time. Except for Bitcoin. Except for, and that's why, that's why cryptocurrencies are so valuable for bad guys, because they're, you know, the whole pitch of cryptocurrencies is that no governments are involved. Well, guess what? That, I mean, governments want to be involved, and they're not going to allow Bitcoin and all that kind of stuff to be unregulated. And, and uh, again, that will, there's probably been a little window of time where you could use um, cryptocurrencies to launder money, but I don't think it's going to last very long. Okay, in this uh, positive note, I'm going to open the floor because I know that many of you want to ask questions. So there will be people with a microphone, so wait for the microphone. Yes, over there. Um, I moved to Dubai. I was living in the Burj Khalifa, and a lot of my neighbors were the children of Russian oligarchs that you mentioned. Can you put the microphone? Oh, I'm sorry. It's on. It's on. Um, so what, what do you recommend? What approach are you taking, if any, to to putting pressure on countries where the government incentive is actually to allow this you know, dirty money in? Well, it's interesting you mentioned Dubai because we found that all the people involved in the Magnitsky case all have villas in Dubai. I believe it. And, <laughs> and, 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 and we wrote to the, the law enforcement there and, they, and um, uh, they completely ignored us. We never even got a letter back. And the only way that we can deal with that kind of situation is, and, and it, it will happen over time, it's kind of happening a little bit, is to basically um, uh, make Dubai a blacklist country so that you, you should assume, and, and, and this, uh, or the end of your amendment, it's a blacklist country for money laundering. And, and countries don't want to be put on a blacklist because then, then you know, whatever legitimate business is, is being done by that country is assumed that it's money laundering. And so um, the only way is, is by shaming them into, into Shaming them with the consequence of, of being, uh, of um, basically being, being assumed to be a, a country of money laundering and criminal intent, and, and most countries want to avoid that, and, and they, they, they're they're sort of you know walking a fine line. They, they sometimes cooperate and sometimes don't, but but it's it's clear and it's obvious to me, and everybody. It's just I mean, the, the entire Dubai property market is is, is levitating off of the uh, off of dirty money. Yes, over here. Well, I know you mentioned cryptocurrency as enabling money laundering, but on the flip side, blockchain can help increase transparency. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the future of blockchain and enabling that. Um, well, I'm, I'm a dinosaur. I don't even know um, what, what blockchain is. So um, uh, it's interesting, though. The, even cryptocurrencies are not that anonymous because um, if, if you read the Mueller indictment, of the 12 GRU officers um, uh, who hacked the U.S. election, he got their emails, 
and he actually was able to find their crypto or their, their Bitcoin payments. And so uh, it's not, I think that, that, probably, it, that probably scared a lot of people. I don't understand blockchain enough to know whether it's good or bad or whatever, but, but um, I'm sure you do, and, and so you can make the case um, better than I can about that. I had, I had this question ever since I read your book, which I recommend to everybody a few years ago. And that has to do with uh, the description of um, that meeting that Putin had with oligarchs in June of 2004, where you say that the deal was that he asked for 50% for himself. Yeah. Where does that number 50% come from? What's the source for that, for that um, conversation? Thanks. So, so I wasn't in any of the meetings. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I think it wasn't first-hand knowledge. Um, and I actually don't know whether it's 50% or 40% or 60%. Um, uh, but I do know that there was a deal done, and, and that, that's that's not just not just sort of from rumors, but it's also from evidence, and anecdotal evidence. So, so for example, um, there was uh, it, it's impossible uh, to keep secrets. Nobody can keep secrets, and so Putin has lots of different stuff all over the world. One of the things he has is a um, uh, chateau, um, uh, a chateau that he built or that was built for him on the Black Sea near Sochi. And the chateau cost a billion dollars to build. It's a billion dollars to build? It's a billion dollars. It's a billion dollar chateau. It's very, like, gold. <laughs> <laughs> and the person who was in charge of building it um, fell out with somebody or something like that and fled. And he went to live in Estonia. His name is Kolesnikov. And um, he has all the records. And the records show that one oligarch put in 200 million, another oligarch put in 150 million, and so on and so forth. And that's just one, one example. Uh, there's another example, um, uh, um, not so much not from Putin, but from Medvedev. Um, uh, there's a guy named Alexei Navalny. Alexei Navalny is one of the, um, uh, he's an anti-corruption activist, blogger, and video and YouTube video maker, and he does these investigations. He did this unbelievable investigation into Medvedev's wealth. And he found out they, they, they made some stupid, uh, like rookie error, where he ordered some shoes from Amazon, um, and like somehow that, like they, that somehow someone got the receipt from that, and then tracked it back to a company, and then they got the company, the owner of the company, who funded the company, and it all came back. Eventually, it came back, and, uh, and they, then they figured out where the company properties the company owned, and, and they, then they took a drone and put it over the properties, and they got pictures of the properties, and made videos out of it. And eventually they determined that, that um, Alisher Uzmanov, who's one of the oligarchs, um, gave Medvedev like $2 billion um, and as, one, as one example. And so to, to be able to like, quantitatively prove that, that, that um, um, it's, the number is 50% will never happen because you can't get all the, all the evidence. But what you can do is put together these individual incidents and you can put together a pretty clear picture of how the corruption works. And that's how it works. And the oligarchs. Oh, there's another one. Actually, this is the best example: is um, uh, the Panama Papers. Panama Papers. Um, every every country had a, um, uh, uh, a star in the Panama Papers. The star of Russia was a um, a man named Sergei Roldugin. Who is Sergei Roldugin? He's a cellist. Um, uh, he's a cellist that's worth two billion dollars. <laughs> that's kind of weird, right? How does a cellist get $2 billion? I mean, the, the, Russia's a pretty doggy dog place. It's not like people are you know, giving a lot of money to cellists. And, um, um, but the Panama Papers, and, but he happens to be Putin's best friend from childhood. He also happens to be a um, uh, godfather of Putin's, uh, one of Putin's daughters. And, and, and the Panama Papers have all these like, transactions where like, one of the oligarchs sees a cellist, but somehow, his company, the cellist's company, is getting paid like a, a $78 million investment advisory fee. <laughs> What's the cellist doing with investment advising? I mean, it's, a, it's a, you know, from an oligarch. And, and so um, you can put all this together, and you can put together a pretty clear picture that the oligarchs um, support Putin, and that a lot of their money is his money. Um, I, I'll never be able to um, conclusively prove that it's 50%, but I believe that based on my estimates, Putin's worth about $200 million. And that the oligarchs, that Putin's cronies and the, and the oligarchs around him have stolen a trillion dollars since the beginning of Putin's regime. Wow, this is probably the, the largest half in history. It is. It is. Yes, for now. 
Are there any loopholes in the Magnitsky Act so that, if, let's say, a person is on the list, but then they can move the assets in their, to their family members, and then would be fair to arrest the family members' assets or accounts? How do you work around these kinds of things? So the, um, the law says that, that the, um, uh, we, we, have, we have these situations every day, but the law says that, that anybody is sanctioned, any agent or representative or nominee would also be sanctioned. And so the Treasury, this has only been in existence since 2012, and they're just kind of getting used to it, but the Treasury is just kind of sort of, you know, adding techniques to, to, to stop doing that. But like, for example, there was a guy named uh, Dan Gertler who was sanctioned under the Global Magnitsky Act. Dan Gertler is an Israeli billionaire who is um, responsible for alleged um, massive corruption in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And, um, uh, and the Treasury, when they went after Dan Gertler, they didn't just go after Dan Gertler. I mean, they, went, they went after every company, every name. I mean, th th there's like 19 different entities sanctioned in the Dan Gertler um, uh, structure. And, um, and I can imagine that he's pretty well paralyzed because of that. Will you explain what happened to you in Madrid after you were freed from Interpol? Sure. Um, well, so I mean, the, the best part was this whole live tweeting. So, and so um, but, but what, so at the, the moment after I was released, um, the, um, the, the the mood changed, and they asked me, um, "Can we give you a ride anywhere?" <laughs> <laughs> and they the same cop? No, they said we have. They, <laughs> they, they said we have a different car. And I said I I, I have an appointment with the um, chief anti-corruption prosecutor. <laughs> And, um, and, and um, I tweeted out I was going to the um, anti chief anti-corrupt prosecutor 45 minutes late for my appointment. And, um, and so the entire news media was outside the anti-corruption prosecutor's office. And, and, uh, um, and I went into his office. And, and, um, uh, and everybody there was pretty upset about what had happened to me. Because you know, when you invite a witness in to give evidence, and then you get, they get a different division of the police arrest you. And, uh, <laughs> And I think that actually it helped me to a certain extent to sort of um, show how important this case was to the prosecutor because um, he, he obviously thought it was important enough to invite me to Madrid, but when he saw this unbelievable shitstorm that, that had come, <laughs> um, he understood what, what, what was at stake and why it was important to investigate. And uh, I had my meeting, and I was able to leave it at the end of the day and get on a plane and not be arrested again and went back to London and, and lived so far happily ever after. <laughs> Any question here? Yeah. You uh, mentioned the Mueller report a couple times, so you can share a little more of your thoughts on you know, Trump and some of the sort of Russian money that's been loaded to them. Um, well, everybody asked me, you know, what, 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 whether Trump was colluding or not. And, and all we know for sure, and it's been proven in the Mueller report, was that the Russians desperately wanted Trump to win. And the Russians were desperately looking to um, find a way to collude with Trump. And we also know from the Mueller report, and it's written, and actually, let me, let me see a show of hands. How many people in this room have read the Mueller report? So, 10? Okay. Uh, this, is, this is a pretty high-level crowd here. So um, imagine that you go to the regular American public. I mean, nobody has read the Mueller report. So um, read the Mueller report. It's, it, it, I mean, spend an hour reading. I know we, we all have a lot of study to do, and, and you know, and stuff like that, but read the Mueller report because the Mueller report, there's two parts of the Mueller report. The first half of the Mueller report shows this incredible effort by people working for Donald Trump to try to collude with Russia. There was George Papadopoulos, Carter Page, Mike Flynn, um, and various others that were desperately trying to find people in Russia to collude with. And then you had a bunch of people from Russia that were desperately trying to find people in the Trump, administration, Trump and the Trump camp to collude with. And they just sort of passed each other, according to the report. And so they couldn't prove, um, <laughs> they couldn't prove collusion. But they could, they, it, but Mueller could absolutely prove that Russia used um, uh, what tools they had to try to tip the scales to. Um, uh, like um, I mean, it's very interesting that you know that these. Um, uh, we, we we don't know what 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 motivates him to be the way he is. And interestingly, and, 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 in, and this is not to defend Trump in any way, but the administration that he put in place, the Republican administration, when they're not being interfered with by him, are actually have a very sort of um, clear-eyed, tough policy towards Russia. 
all this kerfuffle, there's all this, this scuffle about um, Ukraine right now, about not providing 400 million for Javelin missiles. Um, it was the Trump administration that first provided offensive weapons to the Ukrainians. The Obama administration didn't want to do that. And so there were people in the Defense Department um, uh, that, for whatever reason, were able to get that done. There's a bunch of Russians that were sanctioned. The, 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 the Trump administration sanctioned the seven Russian billionaires um, in April of 2018 um, in response to the, to the hacking of the election. I'm sure that, that Donald Trump didn't know about that, but they, they got sanctioned. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I would say that the administration has actually been pr pretty good on my stuff up until a point. Um, it, it, the point where, where it got bad for me was at the um, uh, summit, the, the Trump-Putin summit. Um, and that was the summit on the Friday, on the Monday after the Friday when Mueller invited the 12 GRU officers. And some journalists asked Putin, are you going to hand over the 12 GRU officers? And Putin said, yeah, if, if uh, Trump hands over Bill Browder. And, Trump, and then some of the journalists asked Trump, what do you think? He said, I think it's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't sleep well that night. <laughs> over there, yes. So I guess this is a good transition going off of that. Um, in your book a lot, I mean, obviously personal safety is a huge issue for you. Um, I was wondering what's your biggest concern with personal safety and how do you sleep at night? <laughs> I sleep like a baby. I wake up crying every two hours. <laughs> no, I, I sleep really well at night, actually, seriously. Uh, and and um, uh, I, 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 you can't spend your life um, if you're in a situation like this, living in fear, because if you do, then, then they've already accomplished their goals. And most people who are in, in conflict with Putin live in fear, and then they self-regulate, and they self-censor. And, and that's, those are the people that end up in trouble. Um, in a certain way, I think in the totally contrary approach, which is just go straight at them. And um, you know, it might all end horribly, and it could, but uh, um, it, sort of, it, it kind of throws them off. And it, and it also puts them in a very uncomfortable position, because um, by the higher the profile I am in this whole fight, the, the, um, the higher the cost there is to do something terrible to me. And look what happened in Madrid. I tweeted this thing out, and it created such a such an, a, a viral effect that by two hours into it, so many journalists had called up uh, um, uh, Interpol and called up the Spanish police and so on and so forth that they had to, that they couldn't um, keep me in, in jail. And so um, I'm hoping that that my approach it, that, that my, my approach by being out. You know, hiding in plain sight is the, the safest approach towards the young people. One last question over there. Hello, I was wondering if you foresee Russia improving its corporate governance at any point. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> that was not an easy one, so another question. <laughs> Do you see uh, personal responsibility liabilities for banking executives that turn wide eye some money laundering? Illicit transfer of funds. Yes, I do, and, and um, so this is one of the things that's really been upsetting is to watch. Uh, one of the things that's come out of the, uh, out of the Magnitsky money laundering investigation. It eventually led to Dansky Bank. Uh, I don't know how many of you are aware, but Dansky Bank is the uh, is the largest and oldest bank in Denmark. And it turned out that their Estonian branch laundered 230 billion dollars of uh, illicit proceeds from Russia, and obviously, and, and so. The bank has like let's say seven or ten percent return on equity. The Estonian branch had a four hundred percent return on equity. <laughs> the CEO obviously knew what was going on, and and he should go to jail. And and they should and, and if if and, and and it has to be personal responsibility because the moment there's personal responsibility for these bankers, it'll all stop. People people the moment they think there's a risk of going to jail, they won't, they won't take that risk. And so that's got to be the solution to this. And, um, I'm not sure the legislation is there yet in Europe, but um, it'll get there because of these scandals. And with these uh, words of hope, we thank you very much. This was fantastic. <laughs>